We need to stop blaming our environment, our history. We need to start taking accountability for our own healing. For example, at my lowest, the therapy wasn't working. The medication wasn't working. Nothing was working. And it was because I was not working on it. You could go to the doctor, you can go to the trainer, you can go to the nutritionist, you can go to all these people. But at the end of the day, the choice is ours to work with our own triggers rather than living life in fear that someone's going to trigger us or a situation is going to trigger us. And we need to turn that around and say, why is that triggering me? What is it about myself that I need to get right with so that I can heal and that this isn't going to hurt me anymore. And that's the the work that a lot of people, they don't want to do. They just want to say, I have anxiety. So you need to make sure that your situation works with my anxiety. And that's just not how this world works. It's also not how we create resilience. Resilience is when we start to manage our illness or manage our inner wounds and get face to face with that. And it's scary and it's not luxurious, but that's the kind of healing that lasts. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for being here and for uh, agreeing to share your wisdom with me and whoever's watching and listening. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, what brings you here, and a little bit about your journey through life? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So my name is Rebecca. I am a former brand consultant turned mental well-being consultant. Uh, I have been working with entrepreneurs uh, for the last uh, 10 years as a brand consultant. And through my experiences uh, with multiple episodes with bipolar disorder and hospitalized burnout, I actually shifted my business uh, in the middle of the pandemic to support change makers as well as the young generation and now also corporate uh, organizations as well to prioritize mental well-being and really just redefine the paradigm of success which to me always was something that was external, something that I thought was outside of myself, something that I thought was going to somehow validate my value and my self-worth. And now coming out of that experience, I now help others learn how to align themselves with their purpose uh, as a way of ultimate fulfillment and what I call internal success. Thank you. Um, Can you... Maybe just briefly describe kind of burnout or or whatever that kind of is for you or how you see it. And then how did you have that moment? I don't know if it's clarity or or the decision to say, I'm no longer going to do this. Now I want to do this. Was there more to that or could you expand on that? Absolutely. So uh, in terms of actually pivoting my business in terms of that switch. Mm -hmm. Uh, It really came after a longer stint of recovery. And so in that recovery of my worst manic depressive episode uh, to date, I had realized that ultimately without our health, our physical, mental, social health, uh, and I do say social health as well, because Mm -hmm. we tend to forget how important it is Uh, to not only be healthy as individuals, but to also have healthy relationships, both at work Mm -hmm. and personally. And so the shift really happened when it kind of dawned on me that ultimately I am absolutely not uh, at all useful or beneficial to anyone uh, if I'm not well. And I've also noticed uh, just through my own experience, my own research actually, I had noticed that a lot of entrepreneurs actually have a lot of uh, mental health challenges. And I essentially discovered a whole breadth of work that supported that about one in five um, entrepreneurs. When I say entrepreneurs, I mean anybody who works for themselves. Uh, And I'm noticing as well that this is also an extremely big challenge um, as well on the organizational scale. But the more research I found, the more I realized that we spend a lot of time and energy investing into our businesses and our success. 
And I noticed that even the clients that I'd worked for originally, coaches, consultants, uh, creators, influencers, business owners, I realized like as that- a, as a marketer. Yeah. So I yeah, was- yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Right. So essentially, I was helping them with their strategy and I was helping them really kind of uh, solve a problem for their ideal client and have that right. be actually the engine of their business. And right. then I realized that the engine of their business is actually them. They are the engine of their business. And so, you know, coming out of my recovery, I realized more and more that I'm actually not alone. And a lot of my clients were struggling, not from a faulty marketing strategy, but actually a faulty mindset uh, mm -hmm. around success and what that actually means for them. Right. Can I ask you, when you're having that insight into them, I like, I love how you just put that. Were you aware that that was happening to you at the same time? So it's kind of interesting because to be perfectly frank, I had had uh, episodes prior to this last mm -hmm. one. Uh, I actually had my first episode when I was 23 coming out of my undergraduate career. And then I had another one coming out of my postgraduate career. Uh, so this last one was actually the one that was the most uh, clear. I know that in previous episodes, I was actually very resistant to help. I didn't think I actually needed any help. The, the funny thing about it actually is, you know, when we think of mental illness, a lot of people say, uh, disorders when it impacts your daily functioning. And the funny thing is I actually was functioning, or at least I seemed to be functioning at my peak performance. So I was more productive than ever uh, when I was manic. And I realized that that was actually a big mask to a lot of the internal struggles that I was having within. And that essentially kind of put me into this loop of overachievement, overextending myself, over hustling, glorifying this extremely prominent success culture that we're all that's just being pumped through the airways constantly. And it really forced me to take a step back and realize that I cannot keep doing this. And every time I every time I burn out, every time I fall, it's so much harder for me to get back to where I came from and to come back even better. And so I really had to kind of completely shift, uh, shift my priorities, shift towards something that was going to be aligned with something that is of service. So I can actually feel excited to go to work and it's not mm -hmm. draining me. It's actually fueling me. Uh, and that was the biggest um, transformation. And that's actually how I've maintained uh, well-being for the last few years. And, you know, I don't plan on getting back on that vicious cycle anytime soon. And I help other entrepreneurs and other change makers and not even just entrepreneurs, but anybody who's a high achiever. Uh, I see this also with my students. So I'm actually also an educator at a international college. And I see this happen a lot with my high achieving students. They put a lot of pressure on themselves. They have a very low tolerance for anything that they consider to be failure, which was something that I aligned with as well. Uh, I actually did a signature talk on how to break free from our fear of failure. And I just really realized that achievement is actually pretty empty if it's something that is done with the intention of you know, meeting some kind of destination, like seeing success as this sort of destination, rather than a journey of personal growth and service and fulfillment. Uh, so I really realigned everything that I believed about being successful and what that means to our lives. And I'm seeing the shift a lot of others too. Like I've seen a lot of people who have gotten out of really well-paying careers for the purposes of living a much more harmonious service oriented life, as opposed to this sort of chase uh, mm -hmm. that can sometimes be programmed into us. Can you, I guess, give some words or thoughts to your own or kind of what you hear in your students or others of what is the fear? What are you chasing? What are you, 
thinking you need to do or accomplish or whatever it is that kind of runs you into the ground? I think, I'm, okay, so I feel like it's actually, I find there's a there's a, a latent fear. There's a very prominent fear uh, depending on kind of the community that I'm, or, or the group of, of people that I serve. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to young generation uh, students and uh, even just even just the Gen X or rather the Gen Z that is coming through our workplaces, the prominent fear seems to be this fear of the future. Uh, there is this kind of lack and even the World Economic Forum has also uh, considered this to be a, an actual global threat where young people feel like the future is just not bright and the future is not friendly. And I think that there's a lot of... Uh, media that and messages that are going out there that are really kind of giving them this sort of gloom and doom idea of what this world is going through, either on a political level, social level, economic level, uh, even medical level, when we had to deal with the pandemic and some of these other um, diseases that are coming up too. Mm -hmm. So there's a big pressure and fear about the future and how we're going to kind of survive it. Uh, when it comes to business owners, I feel like one of the biggest things is they seem to be very fearful of some kind of loss of control of their business or this feeling of building so much and investing so much and, you know, kind of building this uh, empire without uh, this kind of certainty that it's going to improve their life. Uh, improve their relationships, improve their self-image. And sometimes a business can't check all of those boxes, especially if it's not a business that is aligned with who people really are. I notice a lot of people are having issues with imposter syndrome. Authenticity comes into the picture. Uh, I have that too. We all do where we're like, we're kind of like, am I really qualified for this? <laughs> Uh, you know, am I qualified for this? Am I right for this? Uh, is this really what I want? So we kind of get these existential questions that tend to loom. And sometimes we feel like just working harder is the solution. And so maybe if I just work harder, or maybe if I just put in more time or put in more money, uh, it's going to fly. And I feel like we need to kind of take that attention and uh, service and put it back into our own well-being and our own personal growth. And that's generally when we see a transformation of the person as well, and by extension, their business or their team or their workplace. How did that process happen? I mean, you described it a, a little bit, but what maybe were some of the key shifts in your perspective or you know, how did you move in the direction that you're going now? I think a huge change is really our uh, our paradigm and our intention is huge. So for example, uh, I feel like there's also been a big change in terms of how we conceptualize what work is supposed to be. And I know that for myself, uh, some of the toxic intentions that I had was that uh, sometimes I would push myself into work as a way of kind of boosting my my value or I had this I had this tendency to believe that I'm only valuable based on the value that I can give to others. Mm -hmm. And so that's actually more of a trap than anything. And so I think the biggest thing that I always talk about is radical self-love. You know, what if what if we really did lose it all? You know, would we be okay with that? Would we feel like we're safe? Would we feel like there's something to live for still? Do, would we feel like we're worthwhile if we're not constantly adding value? What if we were just valuable for being ourselves? And so it kind of took ourselves, it, it took me out of this idea that I, I am valuable because of what I do. And now I've shifted that perspective into I'm value because of, I'm valuable because of who I am. Um, and it's, 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 it's a it's a huge shift. It seems something really minor, but there needed to be a huge upheaval of unconditional self-love. Uh, and that really kind of provided a foundation for me where if things do fail, 
I'm not broken by it. I'm actually using it as more intel and more insight uh, into how I can actually grow more, uh, not just as a business owner, but also, but as a person and a, a person that can be valuable to somebody, uh, but most of all, valuable to myself. Thanks. How did you or how did you start taking care of yourself in ways you weren't before? And sort of what's the foundation of your self-care and kind of resilience, well-being, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, definitely. I find that self-love and self-care kind of go hand in hand. So I found that the more that I was taking care of myself, starting with my physical. So I started kind of from the basics in a sense. So you know, getting into a proper sleep routine, which seems so rudimentary, but it actually no, makes I know, a huge but it's, difference. It's like the most important thing. <laughs> it yeah. makes a huge difference. Yeah. Like the yeah. whole idea of, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead or like, mm -hmm. you know, this, you know, sleep is for the week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I threw that way out of the window, especially considering that uh, if you have any type of condition, physical, mental, uh, in this case for me, it was, it was my bipolar, sleep was the 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 basis and then from there and this is like really just going from recovery till now mm -hmm. you know kind of having that that physical health uh and those those structures into place and then moving into our emotions and thoughts so really kind of working at you know what am i really what is really holding me back right now from the life that i want to lead and what is holding me back from the person that I really want to be, that I know that I am, um, someone that I can truly love unconditionally. What What's holding me back from that? And then we kind of re reverse engineer that. Uh, one thing that I do as well with my clients also is we look at any kind of old stories. And this is actually something that we were talking about related to my upcoming fundraiser, which is all about what are the old stories Old stories could be, and it could be business-wise or it could be personal. In, in business, it could be old stories about what success means, old stories about what good work means, uh, old stories about money and abundance, uh, all these other things, these, these burdensome uh, conceptions of reality that don't serve us. And so I really had to work from the inside out about what am I telling myself? Is it kind? Is it, is it constructive? Is it healthy? Is it serving me? And if it isn't, I really had to make some big decisions on really removing that from my energy and having that protective uh, as well as mm -hmm. positive approach to our thoughts, feelings, and, and intentions uh, is an act of self-love. And that act of self-love becomes our self-care. And the more I, the more I cared about myself, the more I loved myself, the more I loved myself, the better I took care of myself. And that actually reverberates outward. Um, and it's, and I truly do believe that everything that we're feeling inside is often and always, uh, the reality that we are going to project outward. Uh, so this has been, um, my work and the work that I hope to impact others with as well. Hmm. I remember what I was going to ask you. It was the question of the in inevitability of one of my mentors said, life punishes us first, then teaches us the lesson. And I'm just kind of curious how you see that idea of change and suffering and, and is it possible for people to make big changes? I, I know it's possible, but how do you see people making changes with the big pain and suffering and then perhaps, you know, not having it be so bad before they change? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's a, it's a great way of uh, framing any type of conversation around burnout. I find that when it comes to burnout, a lot of people think of burnout as an incident, like, mm. oh, uh, this person's no longer with us because they had to take stress leave and now they're out of work for months. Uh, I know a colleague of mine 
went through that very experience. And anybody that I speak to that is either gone through burnout or are having sort of early signs or early mm-hmm. suspicions that they may be on the verge of burnout, they usually have some kind of intuition or whisper. There's, I always kind of call it almost like a whisper where it's like, you're starting to feel, uh, if it's emotional burnout, which we don't talk a lot about, it could be like resentment or, you know, you used to be really fired up about this project and now you're like, great, I got to do this now. Or is this really going to make an impact? There's that loss of enthusiasm. Uh, there's that loss of energy. And, and like I say, a lot of the time we get those early signals and we ignore them. I, uh, the, the big change is how can we actually listen to those whispers before those whispers turns into yells and screams? Uh, and in my case, unfortunately, I really had to break down big time. Uh, to say, okay, I need to scrap everything now. Now I need to scrap everything because I thought I was healing myself. I thought I was recovered and I still repeated the same patterns. And I find that sometimes people need to repeat the same pattern until they realize this is, a, it's almost like, I, I just got this visual of like a 90s CD where it's like you play that CD over over and over again and it's scratched but you keep playing it and you're like, man, like this is broken. Like I need to throw this out. Uh, and sometimes like we kind of just need to throw out, uh, you know, our original operating system almost, you know, it's time for like a complete revamp, but we don't need to break down and, and get through that pain and suffering to learn the lessons. Uh, we can consistently have that self-maintenance and check in with ourselves uh, from a mental, emotional, and physical level so that we don't need to have an entire shutdown before we realize that we need to restart again. Yeah. It, it, it's such a difficult question to help people discover, I guess, on their own or because there, I assume you relate to, and it sounds like you did a bit of this, like, it's not that bad, right? Or like you're saying, the whispers <laughs> are there or, you know, it's all for the right reasons or whatever. We were, our capacity for self-deception is incredible. And yeah, I just find it so interesting that until we're in enough pain, it's very difficult to change. Uh, although I think conversations like this or, or the flowering of mental health awareness and these conversations, I think, help people perhaps be more open to hearing those messages or, or maybe listening to them. It's probably the mm-hmm. better word and acting on them, which mm-hmm. is great. I'm curious, do you see, I, I can't remember. I think I saw it. Listen to this uh, lady. She's a researcher. And then I think she published something in the New York times about kind of the dark side of the mental health awareness movement in terms of overuse of mental health language and kind of everyone's got a disorder and blah, 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 blah. I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on that stuff? Do you see it in your students and how do you kind of think about that? So I always like to call myself, (laughs) you'll, you're going to like this actually, uh, so I sometimes in, in, in my own kind of personal or, you know, business, I guess, circles, uh, I like to call myself the anti-coach. I, I was a coach for a while and now I call myself the anti-coach. And the real reason why I say that is because I don't believe in glorifying struggle. I don't believe in glorifying trauma I find that sometimes I'm in mental health circles and I tell them my story and they want to just dig through my pain. And I don't really believe that the wisdom is in the pain. I think that the pain is a sign. It's it, it's a signal. It's not it, the, the the wisdom is not in the pain. The wisdom is in our drive to heal. Mm-hmm. Okay? So people can be in pain and suffering for decades upon decades and learn nothing. Uh, 
it's the only time it the only time we really learn is when we say uh this isn't working for me and i'm not going to tolerate this to continue to be dysfunctional because i love myself enough to know that i deserve better and i deserve different uh and i need different and so there's a there's a bit of assertiveness that comes from that and i think that a lot of the thing is if we truly want to uh grow it has to be an internal work it's i don't believe in like for example the reason why i say an anti coach i remember dealing with business coaches that says that said to me why don't you just be a you know why don't you have a group coaching program it's scalable it makes more sense you can reach more people and i'm like that doesn't make any sense to me because what is good for you and your healing has nothing to do with my philosophy on healing. I don't believe that if anybody is really looking to heal on a long-term level, they got to be looking at themselves rather than looking at anybody else. And this was a big wake-up call for me too because in my recovery everybody was giving me strategies, everybody was giving me books, podcasts, uh holistic stri- like I honestly tried everything under the sun. What I needed to truly get at for me to change on a sustainable level is I needed to get right with me, not with everyone else or anything that I could. It's like a doctor saying, well, you know, this person has a, a condition, that person has a condition. Why don't I just give everybody the same medicine? Like that would be completely like that would be outrageous right because my body is different than your body my history is different than your history my perspective is different than your perspective my culture could be different like there it, the idea of having a one size all or charlatan approach to living a life of joy and purpose and everything that we want uh the the phd in psychology that we need is the one that we have with ourselves we need to learn from ourselves and so i don't help people by giving them advice i help them find the answers that they're looking for in themselves cuz ultimately you know somebody can tell you what to do i uh, and even if you do it that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the right change for you you got to find those answers in yourself and nobody wants to hear that because everybody wants a quick fix everybody wants the next trendy thing and i'm sorry but the inner work is not trendy and it's not uh and it's not a collective thing it's a very personal thing uh and it's an individual process so there is no quick fix to anything and this is going to be an evolution not uh you know not a uh, a medication like an event right yeah the word that came up for me when you're saying it's not this it's not that is it's not or it's not negotiable either <laughs> like if we don't do the inner work just doesn't nothing yeah. happens um yeah either, and also uh, i just want to add as well yeah. i'm noticing another trend as well i just wanted to share mm -hmm. is that a lot of us are very i i noticed that this kind of like what you were talking about how we we're, we're almost uh over appropriating so to speak uh yeah. the mental health language i think that another thing that a lot of us and i know the young people aren't aren't crazy about this either is that we need to stop uh blaming our environment our history our like we need to start uh taking accountability for our own healing uh and if you don't it's 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 one of those things like for example at my lowest you know the therapy wasn't working the medication wasn't working nothing was working and it was because i was not working on it So it's kind of like you could go to the doctor, you can go to the trainer, you can go to the nutritionist, you can go to all these people, but at the end of the day, the choice is ours 
to work with our own triggers rather than uh, living life in fear that someone's going to trigger us or a situation is going to trigger us. And we need to turn that around and say, why is that triggering me? What is it in, What is it about myself that I need to get right with uh, so that I can heal and that this isn't going to hurt me anymore? Um, and that's the, the work that a lot of people don't, they don't want to do. They just want to say, I have anxiety. So you need to make sure that your situation works with my anxiety. And that's just not how this world works. And it's also not how we create resilience. Resilience is when we start to manage our illness or manage uh, our inner wounds and get face to face with that. And it's scary. It's scary. And it's and it's not luxurious, but that's the kind of healing that lasts. That's the that's the healing where, you know, people say like, well, I don't understand. Like, how are how do you say that you're not that you still don't have trauma? And I'm like, I don't think I have trauma anymore from what I went through because my my being is doesn't live there anymore. You know, we're, I'm already kind of over it. And people sometimes say, well, there's no way you can be over it. And it's like, you can if you do that work and, you know, start taking that accountability of going within and facing our fears and facing the pain uh, head on with compassion, but also with always with compassion but also with uh, consciousness and intention and conversation with ourselves. It's nice to hear you say that. I'll say, <laughs> to put it simply, I was going to just add at the end there, so many people kind of struggle with the, you know, can I make my trauma go away or can I make my anxiety go away, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that I often say to people, and I think is true for me and generally true for people is, it doesn't per se go away, but you don't, it doesn't bother you anymore, right? Or like the memories obviously don't go away. It's our reaction to the memories and to the experiences that shifts and changes. And yeah, absolutely. There's just no, I don't know if you ever heard of the thing, like when you're pointing the finger at someone else, there's three fingers right, pointing right <laughs> yeah. back at you. Like that's a, a funny one. And yeah, that message sadly sort of I don't know if it was well communicated in the past, but in the past generation, you know, maybe since the 2000s, uh, the message of sort of the value of responsibility and acknowledging one's part in the problem sort of has been swept aside for some reason or isn't sort of promoted as an effective way of living. And I, I see it coming back a wee bit. Um, but yeah, it's hard for people to come to that realization, All right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, because there's this feeling that, you know, I think there's a, a misconception also of we can't blame the victim kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what happened to you was not your fault. And that's true. For sure. Right? Yeah. What happened to you was not your fault. But unfortunately, even if whoever or whatever, uh, you know, caused you that pain, even if they were to forget, you know, they would apologize or even if even like even if the creator him or herself said, listen, I'm so sorry for putting you through that. That's not what's going to get us to heal. Um you know what I mean? It's one of those yeah, things. Yeah, it's kind of sure, like, sure. I kind of see it like this. It's almost like when you, like, for example, uh, I broke my elbow at some point. Uh, I was, I was roller skating and I fell and I broke like parts of my elbow and it was a very minor break. Uh, and I realized, and I was like, oh, I'm totally healed. Like I was like, oh, I'm healed. I can move my arm. I'm functional. Everything's fine. But when I do a plank, I still feel it. So I kind of see that similar to trauma where it's like the pain is still there under the surface, 
But it's also one of those things where, yes, we need to tend to that. It's almost like, for example, you know, when you have an injury, you go through physio to to work on it and, and maybe massage it or maybe introduce new movement or introduce new uh, whatever it may be, alternative, uh, you know, alternative medicine or what have you. But you kind of have to work on it. It's not like, you know, you don't want to just be stuck in a cast and say, well, that's it. My arm's broken. So I'm never going to get that move- movement back again. And that's just going to be my thing. And anybody that's going to touch me in that place that hurt years ago, I'm going to yell at them and get upset at them because they triggered me and they touched me in that one area that always hurt me. Instead, we can say, well, hang on a second. What is that wound? What was that wound? Is that wound a wound of rejection? Is that wound uh, an, an abandonment of sorts? Is that a wound of not feeling good enough? Because we can reverse those stories. Our brain actually is, uh, we do have neuroplasticity in our brains, which which should give us hope that whatever thought process or truth we've learned from our pain, we can actually teach ourselves a new lesson. And if we practice those new lessons, we can prove a different reality uh, so that the old one kind of gets old and withers away and the new one kind of emerges. Uh, so like, for example, uh, say, for example, I had some issues with, uh, you know, I've had some issues with sexual assault. I've had some issues with, uh, you know, just like, I hate to use the big R word, but, you know, I had that experience and, you know, I, I've speak to some other women and they're like, oh, well, I don't think I'll ever be able to trust another man again. And I'm like, yeah, that's because that experience may have you made me, made you fearful of that kind of person, but we can change that truth. That doesn't need to be true forever. And, and we can challenge that thought process and say, actually, there really are a lot of amazing men out there and there's a lot of amazing people out there. And you know what? I don't need to believe that this world is unsafe for me to feel safe. And I can challenge that truth. And I think that once we can challenge that truth and act differently and perceive differently, um, we can live differently. Yeah. You describe the other half of that. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. That's sort of one of my teachers would always say that. It's not your fault, but it's your responsibility. (laughs) And it's also like, and it's also like at the end of the day, we are our own heroes. Mm -hmm. I want to make that also very clear. We are our own heroes. Nobody can save you, but you. We can help. We can give the support. We can give uh, the exercises. We can give the coping mechanisms. We can give the tools. We can give the resources. I had all of that. I had all that. I had the tools. I had the resources. I had the support. I even felt bad about myself because I had support and I was still not getting better, which actually made me feel worse. Mm -hmm. Uh, But again, we need to uh, trust ourselves also uh, that we actually are the only people we really need. Yeah. The people kind of struggle with the... um... I need I can, I am the only one who can really do this work. Although as you just described, that doesn't mean you do it alone. It just means that you must be the one who sort of processes it all because it can't actually be any other way. <laughs> um and all so many of the things you're saying I have similar experiences I guess in like how I learn to deal with my own shit. Um that's the whole like starts with me that's what that means really it's like it must start here and like 
Um, it's obviously not a new idea that that idea, the other wild thing about that is that idea has been around for thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And yet we still must remember and remind ourselves and practice and, and all that kind of stuff, which yeah. you're doing a beautiful job at articulating right now. And I appreciate that very much. And I know we're sort of getting towards the end of our time. I don't know if there's any kind of other things you want to share or things maybe to add on to what I just said, but any kind of lasting thoughts or other things you kind of want to mention before we finish. So I also want to just leave it with a very hopeful message uh, because I don't want the message to be that, you know, you're alone in this fight. Uh, there's actually a, a, rec a realization that I came to actually, uh, even today in my class, I was teaching Hamlet and we were talking about how his grief and his pain, um, is not old. Like his, his grief and his pain is something that even my students till this day are dealing with. So like I was talking about how timeless, uh, these wounds are right. And I, I came to the conclusion that our experience is not unique. So whatever you're going through, it's not unique. Somebody has gone through what you've gone through before. And at the same time, there's a paradox. It's like your experience is not unique, which means that there's other people around who have gone through what you've gone through and came out the other side. So that should be a sign of hope. And at the same time, honoring that in the same way that our experience is not unique, it will always be a unique experience to mm -hmm, us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why I can't say, you know, I'm the expert on bipolar because I'm bipolar. And, but so there's that, there's the opportunity there that we can support each other and make ourselves feel less alone. But we can also honor that we're going to process it differently. It's going to manifest for us differently. So we are our own solution, but we are never alone. There's never been an experience that's been too unique to isolate us completely. Yeah, wonderful. And I think the message which you're sharing, to me, maybe it took a while. I don't know if it took a while for me to get there, but in the responsibility and in the all those things that you were describing is hope. Right. Like it's so hopeful what you're saying. Right. Because you're describing how all of this changes. And isn't that so beautiful? Like when I see, you know, and as a therapist, it probably happens more. But like when I see people have those moments of like real acknowledgement of like all the things that you just described, it's so fucking beautiful. And like, like it's just magical to, to see that happen in people. And, and thank you for articulating it all so well, uh, better than I can, that's for sure. So thank you. Um, yeah. Any kind of other things, maybe your information will be in the sort of YouTube thing and on the podcast feed, but, um, if you want to share any of your social media stuff or just how people can find out more about you and, and track you down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my website is just beandbecomeconsulting.ca. So you can find uh, all kinds of stuff on there. I'm actually going, uh, I actually will share a link uh, with you uh, just going on the piece of the burnout. Uh, I've actually created a well-being scorecard so that people can actually test where they're at in their mental well-being so that it can be uh, an instrument of either early detection or just self-awareness. And I think that that might help with what we were talking about with the whispers turning into screams. So this is just a nice way for us to check in with ourselves and see where we're at uh, so that we can support ourselves and support each other uh, as well. So this is a great thing to kind of test ourselves just like we just like we test with our you know just like we do cancer screenings or any other mm -hmm. type of um blood test or anything like that just to see hey how am i doing uh you know is this a time where i really need to step back is this a time that i need to seek support uh and sometimes those signs are not immediately visible to us and so i've just created this um measurement tool uh, so that people can uh, truly 
uh, give ourselves the real check-in um, so that we can give ourselves support before it becomes too late. Thank you. Well, I love the uh, last thing I'd say is the whispers. I was talking to someone, <laughs> a client about that today. Those whispers were in my ear for easily 15 years before I could finally listen. Uh, yeah. So if you're out there and you got those whispers in your ear and you're hearing those those thoughts and that voice, maybe this conversation will help you listen and perhaps take some action on that. So again, thank you so much, Rebecca. My pleasure. And thank you, you so much best. for having me. Yeah. Okay, take it easy. Appreciate you. Thank you. Bye. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content. And otherwise, have a great day. Peace out.